Good morning. Welcome. Um, all right, I'm Steve Armstrong. I am a consultant incident responder. I've been working in this industry for about 20 years doing IR um, sort of professionally for about the last 10. This is, um, for some people, um, this will be um, new stuff. Uh, for some of the veterans who've been doing IR for many, many uh, months or years, this may not be as advanced. But what I hope to highlight is some of the different techniques that are used in remediation. Because remediation is one of those areas that people just call, oh, well, we'll, just, we'll just fix all those boxes. We'll just go and remediate that. And they sum up maybe months, weeks, and sometimes man years worth of effort in a single word. We'll remediate. Which is very easy, but um, actually it's quite difficult. And if you don't have a decent plan, as we're going to cover, then your whole remediation concept and your, the basis of what you're going to do is going to be flawed. Um, the slides will be available afterwards if you wish to have them. Um, this, the, so the concept here is that your, your network is, is badly hosed. I mean, properly, really, where you're sitting thinking, should I update my CV? Um, and you find that the execs are actually updating their CVs. Um, and it's all about coming up with what we, what we like to call um, the UFP. And that's not the United Federation of Planets. That's the unfuck plan. Because, <laughs> because your network's totally fucked. Excuse my French. Um, and the nice thing is actually execs like it when you call it the UFP because it just hits home to them actually what the problem is. So um, now part of the problem that we have with, with um, coming up with the UFP is that actually people don't know what they're trying to achieve. And it comes down to understanding what has actually been compromised, where it was compromised. And if you don't understand these basics, how can you actually come up with a plan? Now, execs have this concept that, oh, you know, you've been on a training course, you've seen all the various the ways and the stages of doing incident response, either the sand stick stages or the NIST sort of stages. And even here, we have eradication, eradication and recovery. It's a very simple sort of concept. But actually, the planning required is actually just beyond a lot of executives and a lot of organizations' understanding as to exactly what to do. They just go, well, okay, how do we eradicate? So they turn to IT, and what's IT's response? Oh, I just unplug everything, you know? That, that works for some networks, it works for some organizations, but for a lot of organizations, the network's too big, the compromise is too big, or just even the comprehending the scale of the compromise is scary. So what we have in a lot of organizations is what I call the circle of despair. Okay, something's hacked, and you're like, oh, oh dear. Uh, let's, have a, let's have a telephone conference while you hear everybody going on monster jobs quick submission of CV, then you Google as to what you should do. Google, incident response, we are hacked. Um, then you have a massive email storm with executives about what's been hacked and everything else, which is great from the attacker's point of view, because he now understands that you have now detected him. Then you basically just, just, just unplug the system, just wipe it, it all goes away, it's all great. Tell the execs that the incident's been dealt with, and it's all great. And then you just hope it doesn't happen. And that happens a couple of times. You can go around that, you know, IT departments can go around this quite happily. Um, I've been into some organizations where they, they do this on a regular basis. They tell us, yeah, well, what we do, we're just rebuilding the boxes. Like, how many boxes are you rebuilding? Yeah, it's about 50 a month. And they're happy with that. That is their approach to dealing with it. You say, well, what happens if it starts going up? Mm -hmm. They don't know what to do. So, um, famous old saying, if you're not fixing the actual source problem, why is wiping the box going to make anything any way better? If you're not actually going to understand what the attacker's trying to do, what they're trying to get to, and how you can get rid of them, just simply cleaning out boxes is great, but you're burning time. You're burning man hours. So you need to actually understand what you're going to do. So we need some information. And this is quite scary for some execs that they don't actually understand that you should put together a decent understanding of what's happening. What's happened? Who is the attacker? What is the impact to us, both now and in the future? Where is the attacker trying to get to? OK. What are they trying to achieve? If you come up with a plan, what's the limitations of the plan? Some of the execs will go, well, we'll just, we'll just pull out all these systems. Great. You know our IT department's a bunch of Muppets? You do realize that you know, you've just said, let's go and pull out all this stuff, and that's going to take them three weeks. Oh, oh I never thought of that. You know? And you also need a champion, because I've worked in so many organizations where IT security is just a problem. 
It, and there's nobody actually at board level saying we need to improve things, we need to make things better. So without actually a champion at exec level to push and promote what you're trying to achieve, you're gonna end up in that circle of despair because that keeps it at a working level. Until your problem gets elevated up to the execs, they can't actually discuss and give you the resources and then come up with a realistic timeline as to when you're gonna fix things. <clears throat> now when we talk about the attacker, you know, who is the attacker? You may say, well, we don't know. But you might be able to work out who he's not. Think about it, what campaign he's doing, what kind of activity he's doing, what time zone, when did the attack come in? If you're in Europe and you're getting sort of early morning emails that are arriving at three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, you can assume that your attacker might be up time zone. If you're getting them later in the day, you might assume that they're down time zone. So that'll help you sort of maybe work out who the attacker is. Okay. Think about the kind of uh, targets that they're hitting. Are they targeting by IP address? Are they talking about social groups, function? Is it all of your finance department? Hmm, we're about to release our, our results in six weeks' time. All the finance departments seem to have been hit with malware that's keystroke logging. I wonder if somebody trying to get some information to allow them to do some share dealing about our company. So understanding what the attacker's doing. Then also think, is the attacker actually active? Is he actively involved and working on our network? Or is it just, you know, like ransomware? Oh, we've been hacked by ransomware. Oh, you've just been unlucky. Is the attacker actively on your network? No, because he's deployed his little bit of malware. It's now encrypting your drive. He's not interacting with your systems. And now if he's not, if it is ransomware, cool. I know it sounds bad saying you're cool, but I can deal with that. It's a limited sort of impact. If they're not active, is it a case of they are not physically involved or interacting with your system, or is it just the fact you're not detecting them? And not detecting them is the biggest weakness that we have. If you're thinking that they're not active, then maybe consider pulling out all the systems. A quick, quick disconnect might work. You'll see me regularly harping on about this OODA loop, okay? Because I do think this is one of the key problems that we have when dealing with execs and instant response. It's about how quick you can see what's happening, work out how to interface and sort of work out what the attacker's doing, work out what the attacker's goals are, decide on an action plan, and then having decided on the action plan, then actually implementing that plan. This is taken from the military. This is how, sort of how the military doctrine goes. They talk about in the military about battle rhythm, battle tempo. If you can assess what the enemy's doing and you can respond faster than he can, you can outmaneuver the attacker. If, however, you have a decision loop that is the size of whales, which is obviously the standard unit of measurement, if you have a decision loop the size of whales that actually has your execs taking three or four days to decide on a course of action, your attacker will always outmaneuver you. And until you can get on power with his, his orientation, his, his OODA loop, you will always be outmaneuvered. So what we typically get is something like this. You don't see the initial attack. Well, if you don't see the attack, that's great. You can't make any decisions and the whole thing fails. You don't, you don't consider the attacker to be actually an effective person. We deride our attackers, don't we? Oh, it's some script kitty. Yeah, that script kitty actually got past all of your security. You've got a team of 20 people working in your security department. You've got an IT department of 50 people. And that script kitty just wipes straight through you. So don't deride him. Consider him to be well-resourced. Consider him to be better than you. Because at that point, then you're just going to start treating your adversary as somebody you should respect and somebody you should treat properly. Then you end up with the, the old deciding plan giving the execs the option and they just procrastinate, or they don't understand what you're asking them. That's a classic problem with geeks. Geeks talk geek speak, management talk management speak. Unless you can get somebody to translate, the executive will never be able to make a decision because he doesn't understand the question or the options, which means he will then sit and wait, and that is your, your loss. And also just saying, you know, what are we trying to achieve? What is our end goal here? And not the get rid of the attacker. It's too, too, too high level. You need to bring it down a few levels. And finally, you end up that if you cannot implement all of the changes, if you cannot detect what's going on, or if you've missed things like C2s at the observed stage, then the attacker will stay in your network. So this is, what, this is like an OODA fail. If you look at a typical sort of timeline for, um, for a, a compromise, here we have our initial breach. We have a, you know, the typical missed detection options. Then we have when the initial detection act of activity has occurred. And from that, during this time, the attacker has complete unfettered access to your environment. You haven't even seen him. At that point, you then go, oh, yeah, it's bad. 
Ooh, how bad is it? Ooh, it's really bad. Ooh, really, really bad. Then you plan what's going on, and then you brief everybody, and then finally, you start actually doing something. You finally execute your plan. Meanwhile, the attacker's been playing happy games all day long. So you need to think about how you're going to shorten this. And the problem is this is so not to scale. If you look at the old Mandiant report, the, the M-Trends report, the time between breach to detection, it's going down, but it's still, on average, 146 days. You, know? you go to a developer and a sysadmin and go, what can you do in like three, four months? Shit loads. So why do you suddenly assume that the attacker has not been doing things? The attacker wants, you know, those of you who are of my sort of age group, you'll remember the A-team. You know, you lock the A-team in a garage for like half an hour and they come out with an armored tank. You know, you leave the attacker on your network for 146 days, he's going to have got himself well ensconced. So don't assume he's a script kitty. Don't assume he's just been sitting there going, oh, well, I'm just going to wait for the attack. Well, he's waiting. He's not. He's going to have his deployed of his, all his, his various agents and his bots and his malware and his C2. So this so really isn't a scale, but if you think about it, a lot of times we have multiple missed opportunities. Then this whole, this bit at the far end, that all, that just like, this is, that's gone. That doesn't happen. Because what we do is we define the impact, we get some really good indicators of compromise, and then we find more. Ah. And then we go, oh, well, let's look at the impact again. Oh, oh, that's bad. Oh, we found some more indicators of compromise. Oh. And you end up in this, what I call this loop, where you're just applying these new indicators of compromise because the execs are scared. And they can't actually make a decision. So they do the classic do nothing. Let's wait and see. Let's, let's watch and see. Okay? Those of you who have done the, sort of the, the 504 course, that's one of the techniques they talk about. You know, the watch and learn. You know, watch and see. What are you watching for? What are you hoping to see? What are you hoping to learn? We don't know, but, but hopefully we'll, we'll see it. We, just, we, just, we don't know. So again, it comes back to having a plan. Uh, watch and learn is great. I, I have no problems with watch and learn as long as it has parameters and endpoints and you know what you're actually looking for and you task people to look for stuff. Otherwise, you're just going on this new Intel procrastination loop, which I abbreviate to nipple. And you can go around the nipple as long as you want. Some people call it foreplay, other people call it procrastination. So you've got to think about what you're trying to achieve. Now, while you're doing all this, getting all this new indicators of compromise is awesome, but you've actually got to look after your intel. You've got to look after the stuff that you've found. Because if you don't, if you try and work out who the attacker is and what his tools and techniques are, and you don't protect that information, the attacker knows what you know. Which means he knows what you don't know which means he knows that you haven't found some of his infrastructure, which is cool, because he just keeps building out the stuff that you're not seeing. So you've got to be very careful. You've got to understand everything about the attacker before you actually start to really plan your activities. And you've got to be careful that you don't telegraph your activities. Okay? And telegraphing your intent to the enemy is really easy. I refer to one of the earliest telegraphings of a change of intent. And where's my sound? Oh, sound engineer. We'll try it again. Guns, they've stopped. Mobilize your rear deflectors. Watch for enemy fighters. A classic telegraphing of a change of attack techniques by the dark side. And people go, yeah, but that doesn't happen. Well, actually, it does. Because when you have administrators, who you've told, hey, there's attackers on your network, they start to change their methods of operation. They don't get any better, they don't get any more secure, but they start just doing stupid things that are not normal, okay? So what we have is, you know, sysadmins, they're generally not aware as to what's happening, and they'll start looking at things, and if you tell them something, they'll write it down. The attacker's using this IP address. Oh, let me just write that down. He's also using this malware. Oh, let me just write that down. And he writes it down in like a notepad, a Word document, a OneNote, an Excel document, and he keeps it unencrypted on his laptop. And, he, and then he starts sharing it, and then he starts emailing this out to his friends. I was just talking to the security people, and they say that the attacker is doing this. He was saying, don't tell anybody, don't share it. And they don't. They do. 
So here's another way. If you actually look at the sort of the typical sort of user, user logs on, these are day slots. And here we have the users using his, his machine for X period of time. Okay? A little uh, phishing attack comes in, the attacker's on the machine, the attacker works through the night with access to the machine, the user comes in the next day. Okay? Attacker works the next night. Then the sysadmin logs in. Go on. Sysadmin has never logged into this box before. That's your detection time. You've just told the attacker. The attacker's watching the machine. If he's watching what's actually happening on that machine, you've just told him how long it takes you to detect. It's like, ah, interesting. So then the, you know, the attacker works that night, sees the fact that the admin's been on. Hmm, OK. User comes in, admin comes back, pulls the machine. Oops. That is your decision and your response time. You've just telegraphed how fast you detect and how fast you respond. Now, if you do that consistently, the attacker will learn the fact that he has about a day and a half on a machine. So he knows what he has to get in and how quickly he needs to move before you detect him. He knows who's going to detect him. He's going to know that this admin, yeah, this is the guy who's going to come in. He's the security admin. Ooh, he knows what he's looking for. And then later he knows the fact the box is going to get pulled. So you're telegraphing your activity. So things like um, people logging in um, and all of this kind of stuff, you know, deploying your agents. How does the attacker know that you're looking for rootkits? You install Rootkit Hunter. That's a bit of big telegraph. That thing should be there already. It should be running all the time. Your NCASE agents, your GUR agents, or anything else like that should already be on the box. Because if the attacker's watching there and all of a sudden there's these new processes appear, oh look, somebody's installed an NCASE agent, a carbon black agent, uh, you know, rootkit around some, some sort of anti-malware. Oh, I wonder what they're looking for. Okay, especially if he has access to other machines and you haven't deployed it there. So you'll spot these things. Okay? So be aware of what they're doing. Remember that most of your networks are flat, which is kind of sad, really, the fact that your, that your networks are flat and the fact that the attacker can move around. And the attacker gains an awful lot of information. The difference between a pen test and a red team is how the testers tend to use the information, in, in my book. Because if you get a pen test, the guy will break into the machine, go, yeah, I'll pop the machine, and then he'll go and move off. A red team or, or an attacker will actually completely harvest every single piece of information from that machine. You look at all of the data that's on there, the file structure and everything else, he will use that information. Okay? And the, the attacker will try and learn what's on your machine. What antivirus are you using? Okay? What, what software products have you got installed? Because he'll try and hide his products with your names. If you have a security toolkit, well, why don't I just maybe try and attack your toolkit? Most of your tools run a system. The attacker's all, well, I'm only running as user. I've got user context. I want to be like admin system root. Oh, there's an attacker, there's a, an IR toolkit, forensics toolkit. I wonder could I use your end case to image the hard drive to somewhere else? You know? That's why I love it when you see production Linux machines that still have DD on there, still have NetCat. And the attacker goes, you know what, why don't I just image your whole hard drive out to China? You know? So. Things um, have changed because people think, oh, well, we'll detect malware being installed on the box. You know? Dell SecureWorks put out there sort of a, a brief a, a couple of years ago where their attackers are living off the land. They know how to do good sysadmin. They are better sysadmins than your sysadmins. They know how to use PowerShell. They know how to use an awful lot of built-in tools. Okay? We're seeing things like rather than sort of you know, running pings all the time, they do single pings. Can I get to there? Can I get to there? Can I get to there? Because you haven't given them Nmap, but you let pings run in your network. You don't, you don't monitor the fact that ICMP is running around your network. You look for single pings. Who runs a single ping? Most Windows users, ping, one, two, three, four, huh. The attackers don't. They're a bit more stealthy, so they stand out. You know, things like using Netcat to connect to your port 22 to see if SSH is there. Because if you try and SSH to it, it's going to read the known host file. Okay, that's an that's a, that's a anti-forensics technique that they're trying to use now. Because if they can see if your SSH is opening, see if they can get there, if they can connect there without actually using your SSH, they're not modifying the files, making a much smaller footprint. Then we look into the, sort of the PowerShell area. You know, everything from PowerSploit, Empire, you know, the uh, Mimi Kittens, and all this kind of stuff. That is all working on user land. User level, I don't need any exploits. PowerShell's built in, it's enabled by default. 
So they're using the tools that are there. Okay? So we need to think about how we can close these things off. We need to think how we can detect them. As Harun was saying yesterday, you know, normal users do not type who am I. Normal users do not want to find out what kernel version you have. Okay? Some people will, but as he said, you know, these are good things to monitor for. Zone off your network. I mean, I, it amazes me how many big organizations still have big flat networks. And you go, that's cool. But you go into the physical building, you say, I want to go and look at the uh, CEO. Like, oh yeah, but he's on the fifth floor. And your pass won't let you get there. Oh, that's okay. But you let me plug into the network and you let me talk to the CEO's laptop. So why do we have it in physical, but we don't actually have it in logical? We need to start implementing this. This is basics. Okay? Having firewalls enabled and things like two-factor authentication for everything. This comes back to the Einstein thing. If your network is pwned and you try and kick the bad guy out, and he's attacking your security infrastructure, have you hardened your security infrastructure? And this is the problem that you get with a lot of antivirus uh, products and things, that they have to be mem members of the domain, they have to push out a lot of their software via domain and GPOs, which makes it a problem. And if you target the antivirus, you can get things running as, as root and system. Okay, so try and lock all these things down. You should have two-factor for everything an admin does. Your DNS servers, you know, your two-factor authentication server should actually require two-factor authentication to get on an admin, because otherwise they can just DD your two-factor authentication server to their machine. They've, they've got everything they need. So things when we look at like OPSEC fails. You know, um, holding planning co and coordination meetings. You know, let's have a big meeting to talk about the remediation that's next week. The attacker learns about this. You know. And, and this, is, this is not new. I mean, if you go back, to the, uh, go back to the anonymous days, go on to YouTube, Google for anonymous and FBI uh, telephone conference, and you will listen into how anonymous were able to get on the telephone conference first and listen to the uh, UK computer crime units and the FBI talking about trying to track down anonymous. You know? I hope they were on mute because they would have been pissing themselves laughing. So, you know, these days we're all about this, you know, if you've done an Office 365 move or you're using Google and all these kind of things, we're using these, these you know, um, web meets and everything else, doing roll calls, checking out to make sure that only the right people are in the meeting. Because do not think the attacker will not be outthinking you, outmaneuvering you. And having the administrators, the administrators having the full remediation plan on their machine and the administrator gets, gets attacked. Because Every pen test, every red team, and every attack, the admins are targeted. So admins having the complete remediation plan in clear on their machine, it's like a double whammy. So let's look at some of the options, because um, this is what we're really interested in, the different techniques. And I'll go through some of these uh, in a bit of depth. At a high level, we're talking about the, the good old-fashioned whack-a-mole which is the default position for most um, IT departments. Then we have the mass uh, simultaneous system re remediation, the big unplug, okay, and the pros and cons. The big rebuilds, yeah, let's just rebuild our network. Yeah, that'll work, okay? So those are the, the more common approaches. Other ones which are actually used is that sector synchronized isolation and cleanup, which is a smaller one, a smaller site-by-site -site remediation. Or what I like to call a hostile asset recovery method, which we're going to outrun the attacker. And that's kind of cool. It can work in some situations. So let's look at the, a bit of a scenario, OK? We'll look at a scenario where we have a, an initial fish, and the attacker builds out his infrastructure, and we'll see how we can deal with this. We'll look at what they're going to get from patient zero, OK? The two things the attacker wants, infrastructure and credentials. Always bear that in mind. He needs credentials to build his infrastructure, and if he's got a good infrastructure, he can harvest more credentials. Okay. So from the initial machine, one single machine, this is where I say you know, red teamers go, go absolutely nuts for this kind of stuff. Things like the operating system, the software, where it's installed, how it's installed, user permissions. You know, all of the built-in Windows commands will let you enumerate everything. You know, enumerating all of the domain administrators, your domain controllers. And you're going, but that's like really... Valuable intelligence, yeah. And they can do it using standard built-in commands. They can just enumerate everything. Also looking at who's, who's in the you know, slash home, slash users, to see who's previously logged in. When they logged in, that's how they monitor for when your sysadmin logs in, a change in one of those directories. And they can get all of that from one single machine. See, a pen tester will be like, yeah, pop the box and moved on. A red teamer will go, this is good stuff. And they will map out the whole network. So even if he's only on here for a matter of minutes, if he scripted all of this up, he will have a complete understanding of all of your DCs, 
all of your sysadmins, your domain admins, your forest admins, and where they are. And that's kind of spooky. So, our attacker's sitting on the internet, puts together a nice little fish, sends it through, yada yada yada. Fish lands, and we have patient zero. Then he moves. Because why stay still when you can pop lots of people? And now he's got an infrastructure. Cool. He needs to manage it. So we're bringing some WebC2. Cool. A little bit of HTTP, a bit of HTTPS. Now he's got a manageable infrastructure. So his original compromise point, he doesn't need to care about. You're blocking this IP address. Oh, it'd be great we're blocking the IP address. But we haven't understood all of the various HTTP and HTTPS communication methods that he's using. So he can talk to any of these machines. But he also then thinks, I need a bit of DNS as well. Let's put a bit of DNS C2 in there. Awesome. And maybe even I don't even need that. Maybe down the bottom here, I'll do boop, a bit of peer-to-peer. So I got machines talking that I don't even know about these ones. And we're just thinking, oh, look, we've got a machine popped on our network. Ah, and it's talking out to HTTP. We haven't got an understanding of the rest of the infrastructure. And that's where whack-a-mole doesn't work, because you whack the first mole, boop. It's gone away now, isn't it? The problem's gone away. We've cleaned it up. It's great. But actually, it hasn't. So what does this mean? Well, if you're not monitoring these things, do you even know the attack has heard? You might know, you might be saying, yeah, of course we need to monitor this. Do your execs understand this? So when you turn and say, we need, to be, we need to be logging and monitoring DNS, like, no. You know? So if you're not monitoring DNS, if you're not monitoring HTTP and HTTPS, you will never be able to scope this out, which means back to my OODA loop, my orientate, and my observe, I can't do it. I can't plan an appropriate remediation, and I can't then implement it. So I'm going to fail. This is a complete fail. But that's all the board was, isn't it? Can we just get this cleaned up? Because we've got like a, an end of, end of season, end of quarter report. I don't have to report how many machines are compromised. You know? And how long does this take? Well, it depends on how quickly the attacker wants to work. You know? He can work really fast. He's prepared for this. You know? He's been waiting. He's been maybe trying for weeks and months to get into your infrastructure. He could have this scripted up to tear through your network in a matter of minutes and hours. Quickest I've seen is a fish from a user to a domain, domain admin and DC popped in four hours. It's kind of cool, isn't it? Yeah. Especially when your admins maybe are away, busy, rebuilding something else. So the execs think uh, it's okay, you know, because there, the, that's the bad guy. This is us. We're awesome. But that's not really the case, is it? With APTs, it's more likely this. And that's back to actually understanding your attacker. Thinking that, oh, you know, we've got some great people. Yeah, you have got some great people, but you haven't given them the tools. You haven't given them the ability. You haven't given them access to the logs and the monitoring to allow them to actually do your job. You may have some of the best people on the planet, but if you don't give them the tools and the access to the data, they cannot do their job. Let's look at some of those, those options then. So our mass, uh, mass remediation our uh, whack-a-mole. This is, this is the initial response by the, by the, the um, op staff and by the execs that we just need to just, you know, just pull that box, pull that box, pull that box. Okay? It's, it's okay if it's, if it's a small if, infection, if you think it's maybe you know, drive-by type stuff, that could work. But actually, if you turn around the execs and go, what are, you, what are you actually trying to do by just cleaning up the box? They go, well, well we're cleaning up the problem. And then you say next week, OK, we've cleaned up 40 machines. Next week, we've cleaned up another 30 machines. Next week, cleaned up another 20 machines. Next week, cleaned up another 50 machines. How long do you want to keep going for? What are we actually trying to achieve? We're just treating the actual symptoms. That's what I like to ask the, the execs this one, you know? You've got a dog. Dog shits in the place. You just go, oh, bless, and clean it up. No, you train that dog, don't you? You, tre you treat the cause rather than just the symptoms, because otherwise, you're just going to keep going and going and going. Because this is really bad. The whack-a-mole, if that is your standard response, you're in a really bad rut. And it's a case of resource management. 
because if the attacker can just keep popping boxes, if to him it goes, look, look, up arrow, up arrow, enter. Oh, another one pop. Up arrow, up arrow, enter. Oh. And that's taking four or five or maybe 10 hours of your server admins to rebuild a machine, as well as the user time and the user outage. He is basically burning your resources, which is reducing your capacity to see other things. And don't think the attacker doesn't know this, because there's been times when we've seen attackers, they want to cause a bit of a smoke screen, they'll just pop 20 boxes over here for no apparent reason. Then, hey guys, look over here, and they go do something stealthy over here. They make sure they're using up all of your resource time. Okay. So that, that's, that's not ideal. Then you have the, the mass uh, sy simultaneous system remediation. You know, most of the big IR companies love this, not saying that they want a bill pad, but um, it is quite nice. Um, so they basically say, we need to enumerate everything. We need to understand every single piece of malware. We need to reverse engineer every piece of malware, look at every tool uh, that they've deployed, reverse engineer that, look at every, identify every machine, every C2, every piece of malware, and then at some point in the future, prepare a massive new infrastructure that we're going to swap out, and then we're going to do all that. And then you say, how long is that going to take? Well, we need to improve the security of the network, improve the security of the systems as well. We need to rebuild one of these, rebuild two of those, get a new product in, deploy some new antivirus, do some more hardening. Nine months. Oh, I, look, I'm cool with nine months, if it is actually nine months. And if your execs are happy with it being nine months. But what you tend to find is, initially they go, yeah, that sounds, that sounds like a good plan, because nobody's told them the nine months thing. They agree to the plan, they go, so, so we can do this like soon? So, oh, yeah, yeah, it'll be, it'll be quite quick. And that's before they even talk about quoting the price. You know, you're talking about a team of four people at X hundred pounds an hour for the next nine months. Oh, that's going to hurt. So this, this simple concept actually has a huge impact on your organization. Um, and the problem is that if you miss one single machine, the, the attacker is going to come back in. You need to have full visibility of all of the traffic, peer-to-peer. -peer, you need internal monitoring. You need boundary, TLS inspection. You need to have all of that data to actually understand all of the C2s. Otherwise, you're going to wait nine months, do a big unplug, and miss one or two or three machines. And bearing in mind that the attacker, as well as having his, sort of, you know, his main C2 and his backup C2, he will have compromised machines with some really low, slow stuff. We're not talking about things beaconing every half an hour, every hour. There's been cases where people have seen things set to run once a year. But they're in for the long game. Okay, so you gotta make sure that you, you do this. And the other problem is that the execs gotta have balls of steel. Because what are you doing while you're waiting for the big unplug? If you're losing 20 machines a week for nine months, that's a big unplug. Have you got enough spare IT? Building on what the, what the uh, previous presenter was talking about, the GDPR. So you've got machines that are compromised with users that have got personal information that the attacker might be stealing their personal information. What kind of fine do you get for that? Knowingly allowing personal information to be exported from the user. You think, yeah, but we'll keep it quiet. But all it takes is for one user to find out that, you know, in a side conversation when he's handing his laptop, we're like, yeah, so when was that compromised? Oh, a couple of months ago. A couple of months ago? They've been like, have they been monitoring what I'm doing for a couple of months? Yeah. Like when I'm at home on, on my work's laptop doing my work, they monitoring that? Yeah. When I'm logging into my Facebook? Yeah. When I'm doing my banking and my share dealing? Yeah. They'll sue you. If they have an identity theft, that's when the investigation starts, that's when the lawyers get involved, and that's when you end up with a potentially huge, in the future, GDPR case. That could cost you large. So this is the problem. It's having the balls to stick with that plan because it's, you know, going back to the days of you know, Rome, it's watching Rome burn for nine months. Because they're fine for the first couple of weeks, we've got a plan. And then the, the number of machines coming in goes up and up and up, and they're going like, oh, 100 machines, 200, 300, 350, 400, a finance machine, oh, a pensions machine, oh, oh, we should maybe do something. Now, as seasoned response, you'll go, well, what is the point? 
Yeah, but we need to, we need to rebuild the machine. Why? Because the attacker has it. And replace it with what? The same machine. What have we achieved? Nothing. What have we told the attacker? Ah, we spotted you. We've also told them where our, our risk line lies. You know, you, you, can have a, you can have some, you know, some normal programmer. You can have a, an admin staff. You can have this sysadmin. Yeah, finance, no, that's, that's a line too far. Exec, no. Senior IT director, no. And the attacker will then learn by you telegraphing what you're allowing him to take. So if he wants, he takes the other stuff. If he wants to give you some trouble, he hits all of your execs. Go, hey, yeah, you're, you're, you're getting a bit close to me. I'm going to build these things. And they will play with you. And sometimes you have to think about that. Do not think they have a short-term goal. They have strategies. When you talk about some of these APTs, you know, military planning, et cetera, comes into this. You have to consider the fact that they will have a strategy. They will have a network. There will somewhere, somewhere there's an APT with your network diagram, probably more up to date than your network diagram. <laughs> they have a network diagram. They have a list of all of your people. They know who the execs are, they know who the admins are, who the DBAs are, who the forest admins are. And they watch for when they are. And they think, oh, let's, 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 let's give them something to do. Yeah, take that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. Yeah, okay. Done. And then they can go off to do what they want. That's kind of bad. Then we have the, uh, the nuke it from orbit. They go, yeah, well, let's, just, let's rebuild. Yeah, rebuild. On what? You know, we've seen, we've seen attackers using, you know, um, root kits. We've seen them using, you know, processes and malware that allows them to survive a rebuild, survive a re-image. So where are you going to rebuild it? And more importantly, who's going to rebuild it? The same great security admins who built the original one. And where are they going to keep the plans and the design for all of the new network? On the old network? And what passwords are they going to use? Say passwords. So unless you're going for completely separate infrastructure on completely new hardware, building from scratch, this ain't going to work. And if you, even if it is, what are you doing in the meantime? You know, they go, oh, we're going to rebuild it. How long is it going to take? Three months. It's like three, three, three months. If we worked really hard, 18-hour days, all of the IT department, three months. So what happens for the next three months? Uh, can I get some admin support over here? No, we're rebuilding. So again, Rome burns for three months. And then the new improved Rome catches light. And then you're like, oh. So what have you achieved? Well, nothing. So again, it's making sure you understand. So the sector synchronized, this is kind of cool if you have a, a geographical location or some really old stuff that gets popped. Okay? Again, if it may be the finance department, you're going, oh, there's four or five people in finance. Rather than just rebuilding those four or five people, do the whole department, because then it looks like an upgrade. Then it looks like they've just rolled out new IT. It's back to operational intel, protecting your intent. Because if he thinks, oh, I've infected six machines in finance and they've rebuilt six machines, hmm, they must be on to me. If all of finance get disconnected on Friday, and on Monday they all have, all 15, 20, or 30 of them have new equipment that's hardened and locked down, etc., it looks as though you've just done an update. So you've actually done a clean-out without telegraphing the fact that you know he was there. And that's quite useful, as long as you actually improve the systems. Okay? So that can be quite good. Then um, another one, which is the sort of final one I'll look at, which is the hostile um, asset recovery, which basically means rather than doing the whack-a-mole, you actually are going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the attacker. This can work. I have seen it work on two occasions. But it does take a lot of work, and there are some risks associated. So if you have a small compromise, and you actually understand that the, where the attacker is and what he's doing, and you understand that he has, you know, he has some, some credentials around your environment, you can actually do this. But you've got to be super good on the monitoring. You cannot let a single packet out of your network that you do not understand decode and log. You may not keep them all forever, but you need to be able to look at every packet to make sure, are they doing a C2? Okay. And the concept here is, basically, you pull all the machines as soon as you detect them. Okay. So I have my machine that's been compromised with malware. As soon as we identify that, we go.
go to the machine, we identify when the malware was installed, what accounts are on that machine, and pull all of those accounts, reset them all. Get the machine imaged and taken away. Then look at all the, the internal communication to that machine to work out where the attacker came from and pull that machine and all of those accounts. And then from then you move laterally because you assume that machine's compromised and all of the communication since that compromise to every other machine, you pull that one as well. And then having analyzed the malware, anybody else that has that malware, you pull that machine the same day which means you've got to have onboard malware analysis that is fast. You've got to have IT departments who will react quickly. And you can do this. You know? And you can then fully understand all of the machines on all of the network and pull them. If he's got C2s, you need to understand all those. If he's got DNS C2s, you need to understand everything. But it is hard, and your IT staff will fucking hate you. Absolutely, because you're talking about, instead of like 20 a week, we're saying we could be identifying 10 or 15 a day. And they need to be off now. And that's back to balls of steel from the execs. And it can't work. But you've got to be dedicated. And you've got to also get a, hit a timeline as to how long it's going to run for. You can say, OK, we're going to do this for two weeks and then see what happens. Because there is no intel protection at that point. You're saying to the attacker, you do something, I will pull every account. And the concept here is if the attackers come from a machine, you're pulling the machine, you're pulling the infrastructure. If he has any accounts, you're resetting all the accounts. So for every machine he grabs, he loses infrastructure and he loses credentials. And if you can do that and maintain the tempo, including weekends <gasps> and holidays, then you can actually basically asset strip him of credential accounts and machines. But it does hurt. It really does hurt. But. And also, if you have, um, if you have a, a if it's, your network's distributed and you have lots of machines compromised on different sites, then it's good because the pain is spread. If you end up with like it's a couple of uh, you know like 20 machines on one site, then you might be better going for the sector-based remediation of that site rather than this method. Okay? But this can work. The, and the one thing with this is um, the execs actually quite like it because the, the couple of times we've suggested is like you know do you, you want to sit here and take it from the attacker or do you want to and you get a feisty exec, they're like, yeah, we've, we've been pussyfooting around for months and years. Let, let's, let's play a game, OK? Play a game with the attacker, but do understand it will hurt. So there you go. So that's the, the sort of the, the, the five main methods. The standard ones being the whack-a-mole, which I wouldn't, wouldn't sort of encourage unless you, you're thinking it's ransomware, in which case just pull those boxes as quick as you find them. Mass simultaneous remediation, the big sort of network unplug, understand that that is massive resource, massive amounts of um, courage to sustain the eight, nine months, 10 months, year. I mean, you may be lucky, it may only be a couple of weeks, you know, but still, that takes balls. And your execs have to understand that. And if you haven't got the initial information, and if you haven't got all the, the IOCs, and you haven't got all of the, the uh, the understanding of all the machines that are compromised, there is a risk that that will fail. And that's one of the biggest problems. If you, if you sell to the board and you sell to the execs, this will work, and it doesn't, you have had a massive amount of credibility loss. And your IT department will still hate you. OK, the new infrastructure rebuild, um, I have seen. I mean, there's been times when people have done that. The Sony PSN hack was a pr pretty much a casebook example of, you know, hey, we haven't have a new data center that's about to come online. Let's use the new one. But otherwise, for most organizations, that is not going to work because you're building new on top of old. And they're going to end up, and unless you're doing new builds from new media, downloading from Microsoft, and a complete thing of building out the applications, patching them, and doing everything else, you bring any old data, any old VMs across, you're risking your whole infrastructure. Okay? Sector synchronized cleanup, working out which bits you can pull in isolation so you don't burn Intel, so you don't telegraph to the attackers to what's happening or the hostile asset recovery, where you actually go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the attacker and play ball. Do remember that for each of these, you are burning intel. Do be aware of that. Because once, you, once you've done your remediation, everything you've learned in the last nine months, 10 months, that's gone. Because the attacker's going to have to retool. Now, he may come back to his old tooling in six months' time or a year's time. But at the moment, he's going to go away and think, and then start refishing you, which is cool. 
That's, there's nothing more satisfying than when you've done a bit of hostile asset recovery and then you see a fish coming in because you're like, yes. When the attacker has to revert back to the initial compromise method again, you're going, excellent. That tells us he's lost sufficient infrastructure to panic. Okay? But if you have done this, this is where I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a big in, in for Intel sharing because my Intel's really useful and therefore if I tell somebody else I'm degrading it because you don't know who they're going to tell. But if you've done a big remediation, that's the time to share the Intel. If at any point you're going to share it because its value to you is now diminished. So but other people can learn because it might be that once you've kicked the attacker out, he goes out to other people in the same sector. So do share that information out once its value to you is diminished. So there we go. Hopefully that's been of use to you. Um, I am about, if anybody wants, the slides are about. And just a quick plug, um, if anybody's up in the Gloucestershire area, we have a new DEF CON group starting, DC441452. A nice catchy name. It's the Gloucestershire dialing code. Um, so we're meeting there on the first Tuesday of the month, going down into the Regal pub to drink beer, catch up on the Twitter site, and we're good to meet you. I have a little bit of time for any questions.